guest, after three days seclusion, we were informed that we might go ashore, that we were free and at liberty to direct our steps wherever we thought proper, subject, however, to the provisions of the Alien Bill. This was a matter of indifference to me. All that I had seen of England did not tempt me to live in that country, and I cared very little about its laws and savage measures. We landed, the bells were ringing, the people flocked to the port, and we were surrounded, pressed, greeted with the eagerness of a nation which discarded all participation in the crime which had plunged us in such deep affliction. Two days afterwards, I set off for London, where I arrived the same day and immediately wrote to Madame Mare to inform her of my return. The council had sent for me to appear before them. I went and found that they wished to have some information respecting the climate of St. Helena, which I gave them. In Longwood, its situation was good. Horrible, cold, hot, Try and damp. It exhibited an amalgamation of every extreme of atmospherical variation 20 times in a day. But this had no influence on General Bonaparte's health. It sent him to his grave. How can that be? He died of a hereditary affection. Hereditary diseases are chimeras, the existence of which medicine does not acknowledge. It was the climate that killed him. You think so? I am certain of it. But his father! His father died of a series of the pylorus, and he of a chronic gastrohepatitis. His affections had not been transmitted to him any more than his genius. Everything resided in him. Would he not have been attacked with the same complaint in Europe? No. It's endemic only in the latitude of St. Helena. What would have been the consequence of a change of residence? That he would still be alive, even though the change should have taken place only a few months ago? Even then, his constitution was naturally strong, and it has required two years' exposure to the climate to destroy it. Did the formation of the ulcer date only from that period? It had no existence before. It is a pity. A pity. But the tranquility of the world was at stake. However, yes, said a member of the council, he would have upset Europe again if he had been able to approach it. Political questions are not within my sphere, but there were stations quite secure and less than healthy. Who could know that St. Helena was so insalubrious? Who? The Parliament, the Royal Society, everybody. Registers of deaths are everywhere kept, and they prove that nobody in St. Helena attains the age of 40 without either dying or being struck with intellectual nullity. This reply offended one of the members of the council. What signifies, after all, the death of General Bonaparte? It rids us of an implacable enemy and delivers him from a painful situation in which he would remain forever. The assurances given to us by the governor, answered I, were not of that nature. The governor! The governor! Your excellency does not do him justice. He was a strict follower of his instructions. If so, why did he not cause the body of Bonaparte to be thrown into lime? The idol would then have been completely destroyed, and we should have the sooner done with him. His Excellency had opened his mind without reserve. I had nothing more to say and withdrew. I now had the measure of ministerial antipathy. I thought that Blank had communicated it to his agents, but I was mistaken. One of these agents had followed me from St. Helena to London in the hope of obtaining possession of the cast in Napoleon's face and had preferred a complaint stating that amongst the effects of Count Bertrand and in his dwelling was a bust in plaster of General Bonaparte, which belonged to him, but which the Count and Countess nevertheless obstinately persisted in retaining. In consequence of this statement, he was authorized to employ an armed force in order to regain possession of it. The Grand Marshal interfered, and the magistrate, being informed of the nature of Burton's right to the property, withdrew the authorization he had given, and I remained possessor of the cast, which I preserve with religious care. Coercive measures having failed, offers were resorted to. 
Six thousand pounds sterling were proposed to me if I would give up the cast and only keep a copy of it. But I proposed to present one to Madame Mare and to keep one for myself, therefore refused. I had procured a passport from the French embassy and immediately made my arrangements to proceed to Rome. Leaving London, therefore, I passed through Dover and Calais and arrived at Paris, where I applied to the Austrian ambassador, who refused to countersign my passport. I nevertheless continued my journey, but the police awaited me at the foot of the mountains, and there I found officers, inspectors, delegates, in short, agents of every description and denomination. The first into whose hands I fell was a tutelary genius of Chambéry. He apologized, questioned, searched, and did not leave a single article of my effects untouched or unexamined. He very much regretted, he said, to be obliged to submit me to so strict an investigation, but such was the custom. He could besides it very well see that I did not belong to any factious party, and he could comply with the instructions he had received without prejudice to the friendly sentiments he felt disposed to entertain for me. Unfortunately, in the midst of the warmth of these professions, he espied an open letter which I was carrying from London to Turin. This letter he read, and finding its tenor mysterious and its meaning obscure. He expressed himself particularly grieved to be under the necessity of sending it to the minister. I left this man to his visions and returned to the hotel where I lodged, but I had scarcely got there before he sent for me. He had searched and ransacked further and had found amongst my papers some old algebraical calculation. This was too much. A conspiracy clearly existed. I could not deny it. He held the proof of it in his hands. I protested in vain that such was not the case. And these signs were well known and commonly employed. That science is like down with all the abettors of revolution. Respect the king's servant. How have I offended him? By expressions which you must not hear. What do you mean? That rebellion has not yet sufficiently disturbed the earth. That materials are still to be found wherewith to shake thrones, subvert legitimacy, and convulse Europe. Does this concern me? Yes, sir, you. I have never even thought of any such thing. What, then, are you thinking about? What do you propose to do? To pass the mountains as quickly as possible and reach Turin. Do you really think that I'm not aware of your plans? What plans? What do you mean? that I know all. Come, sir, confess it. For situated as you are, and reserved candor alone can save you. Who is this ex? What ex? He whom you are going to seduce and mislead. I? Yes, you. He enrolled the paper upon which the calculations are detailed. Dear sir, who is that ex? X is the unknown. You are pleased to be merry, sir. Secretary, write that he is trifling. The secretary wrote accordingly, and the police personage continued. My correspondence had given me every information before your arrival. I was aware of all this going forward. That X is Mr. Blank, is it not? I was astonished thunderstruck at the horrible industry and ingenuity of this man. He took my silence for a kind of confession, and his arguments became the more pressing. He had guessed it once, he said. All disaffected individuals were known to him. He watched over them, surrounded them with snares. There was not one of them whose hopes and plans he could not tell. But how could I join in with such plots? I had been deceived and opposed upon. He was disposed to make every allowance for youth and inexperience and would willingly give me an opportunity of retracing my steps. But I must confess everything and disclose who X, Y, and Z were. With respect to X, he had found him out. Yet he should be glad to learn from me that he had guessed rightly. Besides, he was arrested. Who X? Yes, last night. Four soldiers arrested him and conducted him to the fortress. As for Y and Z, they have probably absconded. Do you really think they have? And what is more, they cannot escape. How so? I have dispatched the people to Milan and Bologna. Well, he was observing the expression of my features. Have I guessed? Perfectly well. Why is blank? No. No, no, I, I meant to say blank and Z. You fancy, perhaps, that I do not know him because he's further off, but you are mistaken. It is blank. 
Come, confess. Is it he? Who? You know the man I mean. He is a wound. No, not a wound. A mark on his forehead? No, he's nothing of the kind. But this is carrying things too far. It is a most unworthy attempt to endeavor to transform a problem into a conspiracy. To discover that conspirators in X and Y's and to betray me into mentioning names to personify them? Such a treatment, Mr. Roasio, would not be experienced from common plunderers in a wood. I advanced towards the door without meeting with any opposition, it was true, but before I could reach the hotel, his severe were already seeking for me. I followed them and was once more conducted, but for the same personage, I found him in a meditative mood, holding in his hand the letter he had taken from me and pouring over his contents. I have found out the plot, said he. It is here. I've got a clue to the whole mystery. These two documents mutually explain each other for the last time. Sir, will you confess? Confess what? The existence of a plot of which I hold the proofs. The plan of corruption of which you have traced the declaration with your own hand. Who, I? You, sir, read. X and Y remain to be determined. They are then still hesitating, and it is in order to seduce and corrupt them that you wish to get near them. What's more, sir, I must tell you, it is abusing your authority to imagine conspiracies in a college exercise. College exercise? Neither more nor less. You forget yourself, sir. You endeavor to deceive a magistrate. Nothing of the kind is thought of in colleges. I never heard of anything of the kind. Why did you go to St. Helena? Because it suited my convenience. What did you do there? Took lessons of patience. It is a virtue highly necessary with the police, and heaven had provided for its practice. You were living under the superintendence of one of the magistrates of the island, were you not? Yes, and one who was worth all other magistrates put together. All? Died is saying a great deal, but not more than the truth. You only see one conspiracy in this letter. Reed would have discovered ten in every line of it. Indeed, it is a fact. He was a clever man, quite an Oedipus. But for him, but for you, I should be without an equal. And he also, I have nothing more to say. I'm going. Farewell until I see you again. The magistrate made a slight inclination of the head, sent for me again, and an hour afterwards again dismissed and again recalled me, made me rise five times the same night, and only consented after nine hours deliberation to endorse and countersign my passport, which he did upon the condition that I should proceed immediately on my arrival at Sirin to the office of... The Minister of Police. Fortunately, the alarms entertained by the magistrate of Chambery did not prevail at Turin, but the game was only deferred. I was to pass through Bofalora. There I found an inspector who questioned, tormented, threatened, and only agreed after a stormy discussion to endorse my passport in the following polite terms. Bofalora, October... 12, 1821, seen and approved for the continuation of the journey to Rome, provided the bear follow the road from Magenta to Milan and be out of the Lombardian provinces in the space of two dates, beginning from the present. Lely, Inspector of the Minister at Buffalora.